Hey, this is a, an area that is no stranger to earthquakes, big and small. It's something that most people in California, if you lived here long enough, chances are you felt an earthquake. And 5.0, that is something mm -hmm. that you would feel, no question. So let's go to uh, Wendy DeCuna, former <laughs> anchor here at KPX5. Uh, she is a living legend. She also felt that earthquake. Wendy, can you hear me? There she is. Wendy, can you hear us? Well, seems to not quite have Wendy right now, but yeah. I'm sure we'll get her in just a flash. But yeah, we've been seeing you follow the Twitter right now. I mean, again, that's really the reports we have right now. We're still waiting for confirmation on any kind of injuries or damage. But 5.0 is strong enough that things can move around a little yeah. bit. It can definitely mm -hmm. scare you. It'll definitely wake you up out of bed if you were, if you were sleeping. And uh, it's uh, it's something that can actually do a little bit of damage. You know, mm -hmm. you know, we've obviously experienced larger earthquakes where you really do feel like there could be damage. But here, the lights were swaying. It does mm -hmm. kind of take your breath away a little bit. Yeah, and especially when you have a 5.0. So now we're going to start bracing for those aftershocks. Mm -hmm. So we probably expect some of those. We don't know if that those are going to happen for sure, but well, it's very typical to happen uh, right after a large quake. Actually, we just had one that was about a 3.0, mm -hmm. and that's one that depends kind of what you're doing, where sure. you are. You won't necessarily feel a magnitude of that type of aftershock, but we're still waiting for more information from USGS. What we do know is a 5.0 earthquake in the Seven Trees neighborhood of San Jose that's in the East San Jose neighborhood. And still waiting for kind of confirmation yeah. on if there's been if you any go on injuries Twitter, or damage. If you go on Twitter right now, it's just flooded with, yeah. did you feel earthquake? that? Earthquake? Was that? Did you feel that? Yeah. Did you feel that? Did you feel that? Yeah. Well, we pretty much all felt that one. Yeah, that a five, one. A, a, a 5.0 is going to get your attention. So let's try once again to go out to Wendy Dakota, former KPIX 5 anchor. Wendy, are you here? Can you hear us? Greetings, Earthlings. Yes, <laughs> I can hear you. Wendy, are you okay? How, did you feel the earthquake? I'm assuming that oh, yeah, it was I, strong in your neighborhood. I, I felt it, but it wasn't very strong, and it lasted only about five seconds. I, it was. But it's amazing. I felt it. It was in San Jose. Hmm. Where, where are yeah. you now? Are you in, uh, in your I'm Oakland? I'm in Oakland. Yeah, I'm in Oakland. I'll be sitting at my desk working on the computer. And, and, and oh, go ahead. And, and were, did, did things move around a little bit? Did, did, did any picture frames fall off? Nothing. I'm sorry to be a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> you are never a disappointment, we, we, Wendy. We are glad that nothing fell down. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, something to no. celebrate. Uh, you know, because with a 5.1, 5.0, uh, those can be big shakers, yeah. and that can do yeah, a little bit of damage. Uh, but you're yeah. right. It, it didn't last that long. You know, unlike what, Loma Prieta, that lasted almost a minute. Uh, that caused yeah. a lot of damage just because of the length of time and, and where it hit also. Uh, yeah, Wendy, mm -hmm. you, you definitely covered Loma Prieta. I got to ask oh, you, when, you bet. whenever you feel <laughs> any kind of earthquake, does your mind go back to that moment? Um, well, actually, I covered a lot of earthquakes. That's so yeah. Loma Prieta being the biggest one, but I, then mm -hmm. I went to, when I was in L.A. Uh, anchoring and reporting, uh, the Northridge earthquake hit, and then they sent me to Kobe, Japan, right. when mm -hmm. that earthquake hit, and that was a devastating earthquake. Yeah. But the Loma Prieta, I was out at the Giants game, mm -hmm. uh, a Giants and A's in the World Series. Uh, we were out at Candlestick Park in a live shot. But anyway, that's beside the point. I Today, remember. small. Yeah. <laughs> Today, small, and, and hopefully Today, that small. was the last of it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're glad you're doing okay. I'm glad nothing has fallen down your house and you don't have to break out the vacuum or the broom or anything to clean up No, anything. no, no. I, I don't like to have to break out the vacuum. Right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Wendy, always, always a pleasure to hear your voice, mm -hmm. and thanks for no, checking I'm, in. I'm honored that you would call. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Wendy. And, and sure. Wendy's in Oakland, of course, so yes. we're, we're still waiting to hear if there's any damage in the San Jose area. So that's a very highly populated area in the South Bay uh, where this hits. So we we are expecting to hear some, hear of some uh, damage and possibly some uh, issues because of, uh, of, of this earthquake. Darren Peck is standing by here with a little bit more information on this. Darren, what are you seeing on your end? Well, it's, it's all still coming in as we speak, but the aftershock that you guys were talking about happened about three minutes after the main shock. And right now, we're going to assume that 5.1 is the main shock. There's a small percentage chance that it was a four shock, but a relatively small one. So the 5.1 happened at 1142, and it happened in a fairly unpopulated area. This, the epicenter is, it, the best I can tell, it's right near where the Hayward Fault 
and the Calaveras Fault split from one another. They're, they're two very uh, close faults to one another through this part of the Diablo Range. Um, it might not matter so much as to which fault it was on, but it was certainly one of those two. The Hayward Fault, of course, is by far the more notorious one, and that's the one that seismologists have been telling us now for quite some time is the one that has the potential to give us um, one of the more damaging quakes in the Bay Area. But primarily because that Hayward Fault then goes on and extends underneath the higher population centers of the East Bay. So what's important about this earthquake is that's not where this one happened. Mm -hmm. This one happened down on the south end of that fault, and it was up in the hills. And if you are familiar at all with the topography down here, this is, the map says that it was 12 miles east of San Jose. A better locator for this would be about nine miles southeast of Alum Rock. And I think for most people who know the South Bay well enough, you know Alum Rock is the small community that really does sit up towards the foothills of the Diablo Range down there, not far off of 680 to the east, and then uh, Highway 130, which then extends up there into the mountains, up towards Mount Hamilton. Uh, I mean, really, the best locator here would be if you know where Mount Hamilton is. Mm -hmm. This was down in the foothills below that. And anybody who's been there, you know the epicenter for that location does not have homes directly on top of it. It's not like this is going to be right under a neighborhood mm -hmm. or under any kind of a commercial center. But it is certainly close enough to the South Bay that it was definitely widely felt. And at that magnitude, that close to some of the communities in the South Bay, even though we haven't gotten any verifiable reports of damage yet, I think it's entirely possible we could yeah. from an earthquake of a magnitude 5.1 this close. I felt it here. Yes, yeah. we, did. We, we all did. We all felt it inside. <clears throat> Yeah. And you know that if we're feeling it in kind of this area and you start to see the lights, there are live lights up here that are big studio lights, you know that it's a pretty good shaker. I know this is obviously impacting all different types of systems uh, all over the Bay Area, especially transportation. We just heard this from BART. We, they said they currently have 57 trains in service following an earthquake. All trains except those in the Transbay tube will hold for five minutes. This is to make sure it isn't followed by an even larger quake, as you can imagine. Safety first. Once trains are released. Operators do a visual inspection of the tracks to make sure there's no damage on the tracks, and then they reduce speed. So if you are taking public transit today, trying to get to and from work or across the Bay Area, you should know that there could be delays as they inspect the tracks, make sure there's no damage there. So let's check in with KPX5 <laughs> reporter Katie Nielsen, who was in her car in San Jose. So Katie, did you feel it? I did. It was interesting. I thought it was just the wind blowing the car around. And then I looked around and none of the trees were moving. I was meeting a photographer down here to work on a story. And I thought, is he messing with me right now? Is he jumping on the back of my car or something like that? Because the car just kept shaking back and forth. And no, it turned out to be the earthquake. Uh, one of the residents here in the Rose Garden neighborhood where I'm at actually came outside and said, did something just land on my roof? What oh my gosh, that? Yeah. Yeah. Because there was, you know, a lot of, as she said in her house, really loud noise, and then things were shaking inside of her home, and mm -hmm. and she said it just felt like something was up on the roof, and she couldn't figure out what was going on. We've seen a couple of other people who have come out of their homes and just kind of looked around. Not a lot of damage. We've seen quite a few people with their Halloween decorations set up, and none of those fell over. So uh, <laughs> hopefully we aren't seeing a lot of damage down here in the uh, San Jose area. Yeah, and, and Katie, you're, you're a little bit closer to the epicenter. Uh, 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 out here in the Bay Area, or, or in San Francisco area, in East Bay, it kind of felt for about five seconds. How long did it last for you over there? Okay. Okay. It sounds like we lost Katie for, for a moment, but we do have Jonathan Baxter on the line right now. Jonathan, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thanks so much for joining us. And, and, and can you explain what, what you do here? So after an earthquake for San Francisco Fire Department specifically, we go into reviewing our disaster policies, opening up all of our doors to make sure that we can get our equipment out. Um, this is all secondary to during the earthquake. When we have the earthquake, our firefighters do exactly what you do, drop, cover, and hold on. And if we're driving, we stop and put our emergency blinkers or lights on and wait for the shaking to stop. After that, we reassess our infrastructure, which would be our building, 
We open up our doors. We make sure that our generators are working, which we do every day, but we do this again after an event like that. And then we prepare to respond to emergencies throughout our district. Uh, this is where community groups such as the Neighborhood Emergency Response Team or the Community Emergency Response Teams also come in valuable. If we did have major damage in San Francisco, which we do not at this time, those teams would go out and assist first responders with assessing for needs and services of others. Uh, and, and Jonathan, you were at the San Francisco Fire Department. Just to clarify, you know, given San Francisco's history with earthquakes, is there a certain protocol that you guys follow that maybe other cities don't because of what San Francisco has experienced in the past? You know, I can't speak for other agencies, and we are still in the month of uh, October, which mm -hmm. is the 33rd year anniversary of the Loma Freda earthquake on October the 17th here in San Francisco. We are resilient. We learn from the disasters that are afflicted upon our city, and we build more robust redundancy programs to ensure our safety, such as our water supply lines above and below ground services, community response groups, both for law enforcement and fire EMS services, and a robust emergency alerting system. That's just a few of many systems we have in place in San Francisco to help us help you during and after one of these disasters. Yeah, this is something, no question, that you must train for year-round. Absolutely. This is something that our crews on a monthly basis, if not weekly, are going over disaster plans. You never know when a disaster is going to hit, and it's always great to review your plans, your GOPAG, uh, your escape plan, your disaster plan, whether you're at home, traveling, or at work. You know, go ahead, Ryan. And Jonathan, I was curious, you know, this, this earthquake hitting close to San Jose, do you stay in contact with the first responders in the South Bay in case you need to provide aid and assistance to them? Absolutely. So I've already reached out to their public information officer and my counterpart over there, um, extending if they do need any services. I have not heard back from them. They're probably a little bit busy with um, yeah. call volume out there, nor have we even heard if there's any damage um, within that region. And Jonathan, I, you know, going back to the anniversary of Loma Prieta, it's been 33 years. Do you feel like San Francisco, given the infrastructure where the city set up and then your resources as well, that we're really prepared for this? You know, this was a magnitude 5.1, definitely got a lot of people out of bed, definitely jolted a lot of folk, but hopefully not a lot of damage. But is the city prepared for a bigger earthquake? We are, we are as prepared as can be for a given disaster. We've taken... Uh, past events that have been afflicted upon San Francisco, the 1906 earthquake, the 1989 earthquake, to name a few, but also we review other natural disasters and man-made disasters throughout the entire world and see what the problems were, what the emergency services uh, were impacted with, and if we were impacted with that same, would we be prepared? And we evaluate our needs, our capabilities, and our services and try to match that with those disasters. Uh, we never know what's going to come next, but we can be as prepared as possible, and I feel that we are prepared as possible, but it also has some involvement with the community. The community right. needs to be prepared themselves. Immediately after a disaster, it's not going to be like what Hollywood portrays with all the firefighters and police officers and paramedics rushing to your specific emergency. We're going to have hundreds, if not thousands, of emergencies, and we're going to be inundated. That's where you, an individual listening to this, can be better prepared by having a go pag mm -hmm. and having a plan. Great advice. All right, Jonathan Baxter with the San Francisco Fire Department. Thank you so much for that incredible advice there. So let's, uh, yeah, let's check in with Darren Pegg. So, Darren, I guess this was pretty widespread. And, uh, uh, you're on the wrong all computer. Sorry, Ryan, that wasn't for you. What were you saying? Oh, we were saying uh, you, you, you have an idea of how far this was felt across the Bay Area. I do. Um, there's a map that the USGS puts together that can show how strongly the earthquake was felt across the Bay Area as a whole. This one's just showing you where the epicenter is. In terms of how strongly the earthquake was felt, um, I don't know if we can pull up Max 1 on that, guys, but it's on Max 1. But if we can, I'll just tell you the good news. It basically shades to yellow, which is weak to moderate. I mean, that's about a moderate strength earthquake, which really corresponds with what you'd expect from a 5.1. I think we're all familiar enough with the Richter scale and going over numbers. Seven is a highly concerning number. Six is you can expect some damage. A 5.1 is something that will be felt.
but it's not something that's necessarily going to cause widespread damage. Um, we don't have reports of any damage from this yet, but I think with a 5.1, although it wasn't based right underneath a heavy population center, it's certainly close enough that there likely could be reports of some damage. You know what? This would be the kind of earthquake where we'll probably get images from the liquor store mm -hmm, somewhere sure. near Alum Rock mm -hmm. where bottles have come off shelves. I think that's certainly something we should expect to see in an earthquake of this magnitude, particularly down in the South Bay. I don't think we'll be seeing that you know, through places like Oakland or San Francisco, but certainly down in some of those foothill communities that are closer to the epicenter of this, which is in the foothills of the Diablo Range, just kind of downhill really from Mount Hamilton, uh, several miles east of the small community of Alum Rock. How, how important is the location of this earthquake? Uh, Brian Hackney just recently did a story about Loma Prieta and, and that location basically saying we got lucky with Loma Prieta because of the epicenter where it was located. Uh, tell us about the location and the importance of that as far as when it hits the fault lines and the amount of damage it might potentially do. Well, the best I could do at this point with what we know about the earthquake, this one's closer to a larger population center. Loma Prieta was back up kind of like in the heart of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Really, you've got some small communities up in the mountains there, but the epicenter of that was, was even further removed away from Loma Prieta. This one, first and foremost, Ryan, the number one thing to stress about this is it was far weaker than Loma Prieta at a 5.1. That's several orders of magnitude weaker in significant ways mm -hmm. because that Richter scale is logarithmic. And when you get a 5.1, that's very different than where we were with Loma Prieta. Mm -hmm. But it is a little closer. So then you start to balance things out. and You say, well, it's a little closer to population centers. Um, you know, you'll feel it a little more. Good example is... Um, Loma Prieta was felt far more strongly here in the city. And mm -hmm. I think just speaking from our experience here in the building, and we're pretty much right off the Embarcadero here, at, uh, off Battery Street here in, in San Francisco, everybody here in the newsroom felt it, right? You all right, felt sure. that <clears throat> slight trembling. It was short, but everybody knew that was different. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're like, was that a truck that mm -hmm. just went through the <laughs> yeah. garage? No, and everybody knew it. So. Um, it's strong enough to be felt, and this is the map that I think really tells the story of the moment right now for us to wrap our heads around. Well, how strongly was this felt? And where was it felt, rather than just anecdotally, mm -hmm. rather than people calling in or us saying, hey, we felt it in the newsroom, or even that great call from Wendy. Um, <laughs> this shows us a color-coded map, which really puts it into perspective. If we, if we can go back to that last map, the color-coded map on there for the did you feel it information, mm -hmm. um, the light blues on there tell you it was felt mildly throughout most of the Bay Area. And that was on the other map, guys. I don't know if it's easy for us to switch back to that one on Max 1 again. The yellow up there that on the top really shades into about that moderate. Now, take a look back down towards the epicenter. And, of course, that makes perfect sense. This was felt moderately at, down in places like Morgan Hill. So... Earthquakes will do that. The, the energy will radiate, it will radiate out in somewhat odd ways that would be imperceptible from just looking at the landscape. The energy can translate through the rock mm -hmm. and through different soil type in different ways. I think we learned that so um, vividly during Loma Prieta when some of the most impressive damage happened in the Marina District in San Francisco. Yes. Not because the Marina District was so close to the epicenter, but because of the geology of the mm -hmm. Marina, which was basically fill. So in this case, look to the south of that epicenter, uh, Morgan Hill, which sits down in the valley. Now, that's not because it's fill, but the energy waves are going to be able to translate and perhaps be felt a little more as you move down through the valley there of Morgan Hill. Uh, than you would perhaps through the hills or certainly uh, getting over towards places like the Tri-Valley. You can see people in the Tri-Valley say they felt this moderately. And um, Morgan Hill might be one of those more likely places where perhaps um, there's video of, you know, things having come off shelves. Sure. Right. I really think with a magnitude 5.1, those are the kind of images we should probably be preparing to see rather than anything far more significant than and, that. And, that yeah. and that's good news, <clears throat> right? That's, that's great good news. news. Yes. But, you know, it's any kind news. of earthquake, you know, it's going to have an impact on, you know, the infrastructure and how we're, you know, how things are moving and flowing throughout the Bay Area out of an abundance of caution. We have Stacy Hendler-Ross from the VTA on the phone with us right now. Uh, Stacy, can you tell us a little bit about how your group is handling all of this? Have trains right, stopped? Right. Stacy, can you hear us?
looks like we're having a little bit of trouble getting some of our phones connected here. Yeah, but sorry as, to interrupt you, Darren. I, yeah, I just but, wanted but to as see Darren that. was mentioning, this was pretty widespread felt. So people as far north as Novato felt it, south to Big Sur. Uh, we're getting reports to east to Stockton and Modesto. Uh, you take a look at the PAG pour right now, as you can see on social media, all the people saying that they felt it uh, immediately after that quake hit at 11.42. That was the 5.1. Immediately, social media was blowing up. Did you earthquake? feel it? Earthquake? Was that an earthquake? It? Did yep. you feel it? And then it was followed by a much smaller 3.1 aftershock. That happened at 1147. I didn't feel that one. Did you feel no, the No, I didn't feel the 3.1. That's one the that, you, that you question whether or not that was a truck rolling by sure. or whether or not that was an after an aftershock. And we can expect to see some aftershocks on, on the seismic draft there but, but um, throughout the, you know, probably rest of the day or even tomorrow. As we're working to get the VTA on the lawn right now, I do, we can mention that Caltrain, they sent out an alert on Twitter right now saying, due to the recent earthquake in South Bay, trains are slowing as a safety precaution. Uh, they will have updates with further development. And now we have back Stacy Handler Ross with the VTA. Stacy, thank you so much for joining us. Stacy, are you there? Okay, as we work to get Stacy on. Oh, Stacy, can you hear us? Okay, well, while we work to get her, I just want to mention this is what they have sent out to us as a press release, the VTA. Uh, they said their trains will be delayed roughly five minutes or so while they do a post-earthquake inspection. BART is doing the exact same mm -hmm. thing. They're, of course, thanking everyone for their patience. And uh, this is something that can be expected through all modes of transportation. They have to make sure the tracks are all safe. They have to make sure the trains are safe, passengers are safe. And so you're going to expect some delays probably for the next couple of hours as just to make sure that there was no damage from the quake, especially down in the South Bay where things, you know, is strong enough that things can kind of move around. Sure. They want to make sure that everything is safe. So if you are taking public transit today, any mode of transportation today, um, just expect to be, there's going to be some delays. Yeah, but the good news so far, at least we are not hearing any widespread damage happening right, right. now. Uh, like you had mentioned, BART. VTA, Caltrain, they're all shutting down their trains. So if, if you're going through the commute or uh, a late afternoon or early, uh, late morning commute right now, do expect some delays. That's going to be uh, slow. Because it's, it's just standard protocol. They're going to have to make sure everything's working and everything's, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the up and up right now. Also, the San Francisco Fire Department and different fire departments right now, they're going through their protocols right now to make sure everything is safe. And I'm sure a lot of the cities and building inspectors will be going out uh, making sure all the infrastructure is safe. But as you see right there, 5.1, this happened in the San Jose area, 1142, 12 miles east of San Jose. Uh, most people who felt it were down in the South Bay area, although it was felt as far away as Novato. Uh, up to Tracy, Stockton. It's, that's, that's a better idea. But you can see the uh, mostly uh, the biggest portion of the population that felt that were down in the Morgan Hill region. Yeah, the yellow area, those are the folks that felt it the strongest. As you see, the light blue areas, those are the areas where it was a little bit weaker, but you still felt it. And one thing that, um, you know, our, our representative from San Francisco Fire Department mentioned was that this is a great reminder that you got to be prepared. You got to have your ducks in a row. You have to have your go bag ready. If you haven't refreshed some of the things that are in there, I know I haven't for a couple of years. Now's the time to go back and make sure that everything's updated, whether it be medications, whether it be food, whether it be, um, you know, any kind of supplies, batteries. All right, let's get back to Stacy Hendler Ross. She is here with the VTA. Stacy, can you hear us? Yes, good morning. good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, tell us a little bit about what your organization is, is doing right now to make sure that all the passengers are safe. Well, so far, we can tell you that there have been um, no injuries and no issues, uh, no problems along our system. We are still doing inspections. When something like this happens, we go into what's called restrictor speed, which is about 15 miles an hour for our light rail trains all throughout our system so that the operators can make sort of a visual inspection to make sure the trackway is clear, the overhead lines are still in place, the platforms and the stations, uh, overhead bridges, uh, that there are no visible problems. The passengers are still on our trains. We're still stopping at, at stations, but the trains are going much slower just so they can do these visual inspections to make sure that there aren't any problems. And how we long have not had any reports of, of issues yet. And how long do you think this is going to last, kind of doing these inspections? Can passengers expect this throughout the rest of the afternoon? 
Well, no, we think it's probably going to take anywhere between a half an hour and an hour. And, of course, they started uh, several minutes ago, so so we're into it. Um, the delays might be anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, possibly. Okay. Um, but we should be finished inspecting the whole system within the next hour because there are trains out throughout the system. Mm -hmm. So those trains are doing the inspections of different areas. And, Stacey, how big of a staff do you have out right now looking at those trains? And, you know, how prepared is the staff for, for a situation like an earthquake? Well, our, our staff is always prepared for every, any kind of emergency. That's what they train for, and that's, what they're, that's where, what they're prepared for in something like this. So right now, I couldn't tell you specifically how many trains we have out on the system, but there are probably at least 20 or so throughout our 42-mile system. And so, you know, all of the aerial guideways, the elevated tracks, things like that are being looked at closely to make sure that there are no issues. And if folks are, you know, knowing that they're going to have to hop on a train in the next 20 minutes or so or heading there right now, a any advice for them? Pack your patience. What, 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 just to reiterate, how long should they kind of expect to get from point A to point B? Well, we don't expect the, the, the delays to be too long. Okay. As I said, they may be 10 to 20 minutes um, or probably less. Uh, and then as soon as we get the inspections done, things will be probably take a couple hours to catch up in terms of um, the delays. Uh, but we're working to get that stuff done quickly. And as I said, we haven't had any reports yet of any kind of damage. So we could be getting back to normal pretty quick. All right. Thank you very much, Stacey Hendler Ross with the VTA. We do want to mention the San Jose Fire Department. Uh, they are tweeting out right now that they have received no emergency calls related to this morning's earthquake. Uh, once again, a nice reminder. Community members are reminded to drop cover and hold on in the event of another quake. As we take a live look from Chopper 5, looking over the scene right now, I believe this is over some of the BART trains right now, and you can see they're going a little bit slower. Uh, they did have to shut down for about five minutes as they're inspecting the tracks, but you can see the trains are kind of, uh, kind of going slow right now. And this is through over. the uh, Fremont region. This is through Fremont, yeah. And we've been talking about how, you know, all forms of public transit, whenever this happens, they have to make sure their tracks are safe, their lines are safe. So you have to know that if you're going to be taking BART, the trains, even the, you know, the trolley cars in San Francisco, mm -hmm. cable cars, I should say, in San Francisco, you're going to have to know it's going to take a little bit longer just because they're going to have to make sure that all those lines are safe. Sure. And, you know, thank goodness we're hearing of no, re no emergency calls out of San Jose, no uh, no major damage to speak of right now, although I'm sure everybody has their own story of where they were when they felt it. And sure. A lot of rattled nerves, no question, but we're so fortunate this was a 5.1 earthquake in a not a super heavily populated area in, in San Jose. So a lot of people felt it, or everybody felt it, but so far, uh, no serious damage or um, injuries to report. And just to reiterate, you're looking at the BART train going through the Fremont region right now. You can see it's going fairly slow right now. Not sure the speed of that BART train as they're doing visual inspections right now to the tracks, but as Stacy Hendler Ross from the VTA told us, uh, their light rail trains then slow down to 15 miles mm -hmm. per hour, and she says the inspections and those visual inspections will take up to a half hour to an hour, depending on how uh, large of a crew and how quickly they can get out and assess some of the uh, potential damage, but right now the good news, uh, we have not heard of any widespread damage or any damages at all. Once again, San Jose uh, Fire Department has received no emergency calls related to this morning's earthquake. So once again, uh, nothing major to report as far as this 5.1 earthquake. And Reed Cowan is standing by. And Reed, you've been um, following just some kind of reaction from folk around the Bay Area who felt this thing. We all felt it. Right. And uh, we're just going to go through what you, our viewer, has to say about this earthquake. Molly jumped on Twitter very fast, as have thousands of you, making the Bay Area trend. What a strong earthquake it was. You see the hashtag there, earthquake, hashtag San Francisco. We would ask that you also add hashtag KPIX so that we can see what you're saying out there. Somebody here putting, I'm in the Bay Area, just got my first earthquake alert. That's because she has those alerts right there on her phone and she put it right there to make her case. Also adding, like we're kind of starting to see that some people in the Bay Area, those of you who didn't feel it, she said, now I feel like the monster on the hill with FOMO because I've never felt a real earthquake before. Susie, something tells me you'll be watching the ground closely. Then another one out there. This is my first time ever actually feeling an earthquake, says Alex out there. And you know, Ryan and Liz, when we see these tweets, we know that there are a lot of first timers here in the Bay, myself included, who are now looking at this as a way to get ready for them, right? Right. Did you feel it? 
I did not feel it. Oh, my goodness. But I thought, this is like a community exercise, right? Uh -huh. When things like this happen, we are able to sort of put into practice. I texted my kids who just went through okay. training at their school up in, in the North Bay, and they, they didn't feel it either, but they said this was our chance to practice what we've been taught. Jen is on Twitter right now. So is Gerald. He says, a 5.0 earthquake, 3.0 aftershock. Be ready. And that really underscores whether the numbers are exactly right right now from USGS. Those two last words, be ready, really are instructive it's to so us. It's so important. To be, it's a great reminder. I mean, thank goodness this one so far has not caused any major damage. Mm -hmm. But it's a good reminder to make sure that you are ready. You have some sort of way to communicate with your kids if there is a big earthquake or a big right. natural disaster. And that you do have your, your go kit ready and your emergency kit at home ready to go. And, uh, you know, a lot of firefighters... We talked to after earthquakes like this, they are actually grateful for them because it's just a good reminder. It's a great way to kind of train in case there is a, and you can work out some of the bugs that maybe you haven't right. quite worked out yet. Um, so, you know, thank goodness again, 5.1. No major damage, but a good reminder. And I know Mary Lee is on the phone right now. Mary, can you hear us? Hi, Liz. Yeah, I can. Uh, we're on 11:40. I'm at home. It's, we're in South San Jose, and specifically mm -hmm. Southeast San Jose. And we felt, we heard that rumble, and then we felt the whole entire house shake. The windows were rattling. The whole house was shaking. Wow. It lasted for five seconds or more of that shaking and my little dog Cairo he was so scared he looked at me like what is going on <laughs> oh, and I no. looked at the, the USDS website and we are close to the epicenter so we really felt that intense shaking for the entire house any damage anything fall off the shelves anything like that no thankfully not even uh, from the all of our pictures and our frames hanging up um, on the walls. Nothing, no damage, thankfully so. But yeah, it was just a lot of violent shaking mm -hmm. that lasted uh, quite some time. I thought it would just last a, you know, a second or two, but it did last for five seconds or more. So Mary, I was curious, your little furry one's a little scared. Did, did, did they kind of anticipate the earthquake? Because a lot of times the animals, they can feel it before it actually, before we feel it. Right. Yeah, I, um, he was just walking around with me. He stood, he stood in place for a little bit before anything happened, but I didn't think anything of that. And then really his eyes just got so big looking at me, Aww. kind of like, Mom, help me, what's going on? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Now, Mary, you know, you're a meteorologist, so we know you know a lot about earthquakes, but I'm curious, had you ever really been in something this big before? Oh, looks like we might have lost Mary. Mary, can you hear us? All right, looks like we might have lost Mary there. But uh, again, if you're just joining us, that was an earthquake you felt about 30 minutes ago, 5.0, centered around San Jose. And uh, let's get to Gianna, who I think has a little bit more on, on how traffic is impacted by all of this. Gianna? Hey guys, yeah, I'm going to keep. I'm keeping a close eye, obviously, on public transit. You just spoke to Stacy Handler Ross from VTA, and at last check, they're running about 15 miles per hour for VTA light rail. This is pretty standard when earthquakes happen. That BART, Caltrain, VTA all run at reduced speed, so they can do the inspections. Uh, it should take about another 30 minutes to see VTA get back on track. But for anyone who plans on using that within the next few minutes or within the next hour, plan on those delays or expect at least some slow. Speeds when you're on the trains. The latest from BART is because of that earlier earthquake, trains are still running at reduced speeds just so they can complete the track inspections. They're saying those residual delays are about 10 to 15 minutes, so that's a bit of an improvement. They were saying major delays just about five minutes ago, so it looks like they're starting to just kind of do all those checks and hopefully getting things back on track. So expect about a 10 to 15 minute delay system wide if you do plan on using BART in the next hour or so. Caltrain also running at reduced speeds also to do track inspections. Again, this is pretty standard whenever we have an earthquake in the area just to make sure things are running smoothly. There's no damages to the tracks. I do know train 116 specifically heading in the southbound direction is about 10 minutes behind schedule. Train number 117 northbound about 10 minutes behind schedule as well. No major incidents or issues on any of the roadways. Just kind of looking at any sort of CHP incidents coming in, uh, especially in the South Bay. Everything seems to be moving nicely and okay on the 
freeways overall. There is a trouble spot in Mountain View, but that was not related at all to what had happened uh, with the earthquake. But definitely with public transit, that is something that they do typically to make sure everything is running smoothly. And so far, so good. You just kind of have to deal with those delays until they finish those inspections. Yeah, always a good thing when you know that they are taking their time mm -hmm. to make sure the tracks and the lines and the cables or whatever they run on are safe, the streets are safe, um, and so just expect some delays. And we know that that's going to be happening probably within the next hour. Pack your patience. Pack your patience, and it's all for a good cause. Very, very, very good cause as they do those visual inspections. So thanks for joining us if you're following us. Uh, maybe you felt it, maybe you didn't feel it. Uh, 1142 this morning, we had a 5.1 magnitude earthquake that was followed five minutes later by a 3. One aftershock here in the KPIX 5 studios. Uh, we felt it here. Uh, we saw the lights moving ahead uh, above us, which is always a little bit of a, a, a nervous moment because we yeah, never know if like things are going to start falling down on top of us. But luckily, nothing uh, to report as far as damages here in San Francisco. Uh, the epicenter down in the South Bay, also San Jose Police Department, saying nothing to report, or at least no emergency calls due to the earthquake as of right now. Yeah, but folks down in the uh, oh, Reed Cowan is standing by. You've got something new, Reed. Well, we're just watching everywhere you're expressing on social media and elsewhere. And we're looking at the My Shake app. You know, so many of us have been encouraged to get that My Shake app so mm -hmm. that we have that advance warning. And you do see what you've been talking about that, that they're calling it, if you're in the app, they're calling it the Seven Trees, California area. But there's also a metric there in the app that gives you a chance to sound off within the app. It's called Share Your Experience. Right now, 1,584 people are weighing in about what they felt. This is what's really interesting. They break that down. 931 people say it was light shaking. And about 306 of you who responded there on the My Shake app said it was pretty moderate shaking, and 21 said strong shaking. So that conversation is happening there. This community conversation also happening on Twitter. We're watching all of you. 5.0 earthquake, 3.0 aftershock. Again, that underscore be ready. Yeah, and you can, of course, expect other aftershocks potentially later on in the day. That's kind of what happens with, a, with an earthquake like this. Afterwards, you experience some, mm -hmm. some aftershocks. And, of course, we'll be hopefully talking to USGS in the near future here to get a little bit more information about where this earthquake was, what fault line it was on, and uh, just what, you know, what this means for the earthquake preparedness in, in our area and what it means for the different fault lines. Yeah, it's a good thing that the, the shake alert system is now working. Mm -hmm. uh, so that gives a few people... people People about a few seconds before the uh, actual earthquake happened, so it's curious to see how quickly this shake alert actually happened. But the uh, USGS is reporting that 11,150 people felt the quake, and I'm not sure if that means that's how many alerts were sent out, or if that means how many people have, they think, have called in. Have called in about this, because <laughs> there's definitely a lot more than 11,000 people here yes. in the Bay Area that likely felt this quake, because it was pretty widespread. Uh, as Darren was showing us, as you see this map, did you feel it? Well, a lot of people felt as far north as Novato, all the way out to Stockton and Modesto. They felt it, and you definitely felt it if you were in the South Bay this morning. Yeah, we talked to Mary Lee. She said that her whole, and she's down in San Jose, very close to the epicenter, and said she felt like her entire house was shaky. You can feel, you could see the windows rattling there, and it mm -hmm. is unnerving. Even though if you've been in many earthquakes before, when you feel that initial jolt, it's scary. I've been in many earthquakes, and it, and it still kind of takes your breath. Away there yeah. for a minute. You're not quite sure. Do I get under the desk? Do I? What, what do I do? You have to kind of remind yourself. You go into a little bit of a shock there, but good to know that it was a 5.1, no damage, no injuries. And uh, but of course, folks down in San Jose, they really felt it up here in San Francisco. You felt it. Kind of, it whether or not you felt it kind of okay. depended on where you were. So let's go to Kimberly Bisniak at San Jose Department of Geology. So Kimberly, can you hear us right now? Yes, I can. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So what can you tell us about specifically about this earthquake? So um, this earthquake, um, one of the reasons why we felt um, the earthquake so strongly, um, even though it was uh, 5.1, is that it uh, ruptured, um, it was a shallow earthquake in a sense that where the earthquake started, nucleated from, was only at about 6.9 kilometers depth beneath the surface. And it occurred on a fault. Um, it looks like to me, just based on looking at the map of the location of the epicenter, um, the Calaveras Fault, which is um, a right lateral strike slip fault that runs um, uh, along uh, the, the East Bay um, near, um, you know, uh, just south of um, San Jose. 
So a relatively shallow, a shallow earthquake, Kimberly. And, and can you describe a little bit what that means? It just means it doesn't go to the to the depths of the core. What, what does that mean when you say a shallow earthquake? So, so a, a good way to think about um, an earthquake is uh, I use this uh, this analogy is like when you throw a um, pebble mm -hmm. into a, a pond. Um, the, the the pebble when it hits the, that water mm -hmm. is is the earthquake okay and then earthquake is an earthquake is basically energy and so when an earthquake ruptures um, it basically releases energy and that energy occur, um, travels in the form of waves similar to the ripples that you see when um, the uh, you throw that pebble into a pond. And so you can imagine if you had um, uh, the, the earthquake and that energy being released and you kind of turn those ripples um, 90 degrees, mm -hmm. right? That if you, if you um, that energy, when it reaches the surface, those initial ripples, if you were um, very close to the surface, then you feel bigger, more ripples. Uh, traveling through to the surface, whereas if that earthquake were to occur much deeper, then you feel those ripples a little less. Interesting. And, and Kimberly, so yeah. much is made about the different fault lines uh, from the San Andreas fault line. Lately, we talk so much about the Hayward fault. We have a map right now of the Calos Veras fault. Uh, can you talk about the significance of this fault line, where it runs, and, and some of the communities that potentially are impacted by this fault line? Sure. So the Calaveras Fault is um, uh, runs along the the East Bay, and what what happens? The Calaveras and the Hayward Fault are the two main faults that um, the uh, mm -hmm. USGS and forecast the Earthquake Science Center um, is likely to um, rupture in a um, magnitude, you know, 6.1 or above. In the next 30 years, it has the, they, they both have very high probability to rupture in a what we call a surface rupturing earthquake. Whereas when we have an earthquake, it what we felt were just kind of like that the energy waves, and there wasn't any rupture on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we we anticipate that the um, earthquake will, will will rupture, and what what happens with the Calaveras and Hayward fault is that the Calaveras fault. Um, uh, comes up and just um, near Mission Peak takes a, a, a left step. It steps over and the Hayward Fault picks up. And so these two faults uh, work as a system similar to the, the San Andreas system that is a plate boundary between the North American plate and the Pacific plate. And what's happening is that these two plates are moving past each other. And as they're moving past each other, all of the faults that um, are riddled across the Bay Area, including the San Andreas, Hayward, Calaveras, um, where we are, uh, accommodate that movement between the two places. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Kimberly Blizniak with the uh, San Jose State Geology Department. Reed, what do you got? Well, those of you on Twitter who are responding are now starting to show us some video. Watch this. This is a shelf here, we understand, in the city. Somebody had the presence of mind to turn on their phone. Let's listen. All right, no sound there. But you are seeing kind of some waving and some shaking there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as always, let's continue this community conversation. This is the place where we will gather around the table, so to speak. There you go. You see a computer there shaking back yep. and forth uh, down in Santa Cruz. Uh, so somebody there saw that video, and we'd like to see more. Obviously, you see them head to the door before they cut the video off. Right? All right, yeah. Uh, the first video was from mm -hmm. Liam Mecklen, who's a friend of, of KPIX5, and he's in San Francisco. And mm -hmm. you can imagine he was a little <laughs> nervous there watching his shelves yeah. uh, vibrate a little bit there. All right, let's get to Ryan Hayes. He is in the Silver Creek Valley Country Club. That's down in San Jose. Ryan, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. How does it feel where, where you were at? Uh, it was. It shook our uh, clubhouse pretty good. Um, it uh, it kind of startled all of us here in the golf shop, and we were uh, surprised by it and thought it was just you know something moving around in our clubhouse, and then realized it was an earthquake. I can imagine all those yeah. golf clubs rattling mm -hmm. back and forth. There, anything fall off the shelves? Any minor damage there? 
No, no major damage. Uh, just some sunglasses in the shop fell, but other than that, uh, it held up pretty good. But it it shook us really hard. Yeah. I can imagine if there were there folks out on the golf course when it happened. Were they wondering what was going on? There were. We did get a few phone calls from people that were asking uh, if we felt that and and if that was a earthquake. Um, and we said yes, it was. And um, but yes, everybody here is uh, is is okay. And, and have you ever been in an earthquake this of this size before? I have not. I've lived in the Bay Area for since about 2004, and this was probably one of the bigger ones that I've ever felt. So, Ryan, kind of describe the how did it feel, and and, and how long did it go? It it felt like a big old rattle, and it probably felt like it went on for about oh five or ten seconds, and we just kind of stood and weren't really sure what to do, and sure. then mm -hmm. once it stopped, we all felt better. And I'm curious, you know, I, I can imagine what a golf shop is. There's lots of things hanging on the on the walls there. Anything you guys are kind of doing, make sure things are, are tightened up and secure. Anything that is different about your operation right now, just to kind of make sure everything is safe. Yeah, we just walked around and looked and make sure everything was still in place and checked on everybody. And uh, as a whole, it uh, it held up pretty good. So nothing uh, nothing too major. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Ryan Hayes of the Silver Creek Valley Country Club in San Jose. Let's get back to Darren Peck, a little bit more on the epicenter where this quake was actually felt. And uh, to be specific on that, just about two miles south of Mount Hamilton. If anyone's ever taken the drive up that road, it's a gorgeous winding road that goes into the mountains to the east side of the Santa Clara Valley. Mount Hamilton's got that historic Lick Observatory on it. The epicenter for this was about two to three miles south of that in the hills. In fact, there's a county regional park there that's nothing but wide open space with no structures on it. That's where the epicenter of this earthquake was. So a little more perspective on where this was felt, because the information for how strongly this was felt and where it was felt is constantly updating. So we're going to start out with a close-up view to show you pretty light. In, in and around the South Bay, when you get into the shades of light green on this map, the only thing this map is telling you is the intensity of the shaking that's been reported by people. And that light green on there, that scale is like a moderate, like a weak to moderate. That's great news. We're not seeing a whole lot of yellow or orange showing up here. But if we come out for the wider view, now that we've had some time for the reports to come in, this is new information to see how widely felt this uh, is being reported. And it does extend well up into the North Bay now. Folks in Sonoma and Napa County are saying they felt it, although that shades into the light green. We know it was felt through the city and the East Bay. We've already had firsthand reports of that. But look how far south this went as well, a little bit farther south than north. And the epicenter coming in in the South Bay, we haven't seen an earthquake um, this strong in, in quite a while in the Bay Area. The last one, which was notably stronger than this, was the earthquake that happened in Napa, mm -hmm. uh, which so many of us remember. That one was 2014. That one was a 6.0. And that one, we did have, you know, images of damaged buildings. This one, that is not likely. A 5.1 kind of falls in that range where it's going to be felt. You might have some things that have fallen off shelves, but from a 5.1 to like a 5.5, you're not really going to get a whole lot of structural damage to buildings, especially one that is centered uh, in the mountains like that and not directly underneath any communities or urban centers. Now, in terms of the fault line, we were getting information from the seismologist on the phone about 20 minutes ago, and we can visualize not only the Calaveras Fault, but how close it is to the Hayward. And if you watch the red lines, the Hayward Fault's the notorious one. The Calaveras Fault is the one over here that kind of cuts up through the East Bay Hills. That name doesn't roll off the tongue for most people. San Andreas does, Hayward does, and that's pretty much where it stops. But there's a whole series of fault lines here which splay off of the main San Andreas to kind of take up the movement. I mean, we're, it's all doing the same thing. They're all strike slip faults, but it, it doesn't just happen on the San Andreas. There's so much movement in the Earth's crust happening that you've got all of these different fractures trying to accomplish the same thing, mm -hmm. which is taking the Pacific plate over here and moving it towards Alaska and the North American plate over here and moving it down to the south. So this was one small little movement to accomplish that process. The Calaveras Fault is the southern edge of this complex that's kind of a juncture between the Hayward and the Calaveras. They do kind of verge. And there has been some recent work done from the USGS to look at those two with the potential to work in tandem. 
this likely wasn't that. This likely was centered strictly on the Calaveras fault. And by the way, she did go into the depth on it uh, relatively low. I mean, she gave it to you in kilometers. This was about four miles deep. For perspective, Loma Prieta was about 13 miles deep.